Hello and welcome. In this episode, we are going to talk about what's happening on the front line and it's fairly static along the front lines. So we are going to focus on the political infighting that is happening, the developments within Russia. We are going to talk about what's going on in Kherson and we are going to talk about the mobilization and we're going to finish and wrap it and wrap it all up with the support for both sides that is going to happen, which might indicate some massive developments for the future. But let's just start. There has been a massive air attack on uh, on the Ukrainian civilian infrastructure again. 55 KH-101 and KH-555 or triple five were used by the Russian side. They are mostly launched from strategic bombers. And of those 55, Ukraine is saying they shot down 45. The attacks were against again against the civilian infrastructure and were meant as a revenge for the Ukrainian drone attack on the harbor of Sevastopol. Those attacks, though, have to be pre-planned, so we can expect the Russian government to have a pre-planned list of revenge attacks in case they need to do them. And that's not meant that those attacks would not happen otherwise, but we can expect the Russian government, the Russian military to have pre-planned all those attacks so they can immediately strike back and not lose the support of the, their own hinterland, of the military bloggers, which would otherwise accuse the Russian government of weakness. The Russian attacks are clearly aimed at destroying the civilian infrastructure, mostly water, internet and uh, electricity. And this has been successful in Kiev, at least for some time, 80% didn't have fresh water. Uh, there is no military reason in doing that, so it can be clearly be called um, terrorist attacks. Uh, one good news in the context was at least that the fr just recently delivered German Iris T system has been used and the Ukrainian side said it destroyed 100% of the targets it fired upon. When we come to the Eastern Front, we have reports of uh, the Ukrainian sites is saying they defeated a Russian attack on Mykolaivka, which would indicate that it's now in Ukrainian hand. Otherwise, they couldn't defeat it, even though I don't have a full proof of that. The Russians are saying they defeated Ukrainian attacks on Tabaivka, uh, Tabaivka and on Berestove here. Ukrainians are saying they have fire control over the R-66, that's the road between Svatove and Krimina. It's probably here to Karmasunivka, which was recently conquered this few last days as well, uh, as the high ground would probably allow them to look down. Fire control in this context has to be seen that uh, it means they can shoot at it. So they see movement and they can directly attack it and prevent that movement. It's not, it doesn't mean that the Ukrainian boots are actually on the road yet. So in dark weather or something in bad weather or with the uh, with high speed, there might be still some, some usage of that road, but it's now under direct threat by the Ukrainian side. It's also possible that this was close to uh, Chervono Popivka, but here the Russians say they defeated a Ukrainian attack, which on the other hand would mean they are fairly close to the town as of now. Uh, we have reports that are somewhat contradicting when it comes to a bridge to, over the Krasna River in Kras, uh, Krasnorich. Um, the, both sides are actually accusing each other of it. Um, the Russian side, Russian military bloggers are saying it was Ukrainian artillery and this at least would be, would look like it to me. Um, we can see the crater here and we see some damage on the, the railings. So I would uh, think it actually looks a little bit like this. Pro-Ukrainian side is saying that it was the, the, um, that it was the, the Russians themselves blowing it up. But in this regard, um, it's kind of has some kind of importance, even though the contradictions are kind of weird. You see a few other videos, a few other images of it here, because as it is here, it's behind the front line. So if the Russians were actually to blow it up already, then that would indicate that they are more or less in the process of evacuating that area or that they already have. Um, I don't really see a reason for that already and as I said this looks to me like artillery craters so it might be that the uh, Ukrainian artillery shelled it maybe they hit 
pre-prepared um, explosives with their artillery fire because right now for the Ukrainians it should be an advantage as any attacks in this area will not be able to get easy reinforcements and they won't get uh, the Russian forces will won't get supplies along this line over this bridge anymore regardless of this we have further reports about Belorivka both sides basically say the other attack here the Ukrainians say they defeated an attack on it and the Russians are saying the Ukrainians are attacking eastwards in probing attacks and recon attacks out of Bilohorivka. Further south, we have um, uh, more fighting, but now it's becoming interesting because we have this image here from the 30th of October, and it might have been earlier, where the Russian media did interviews with soldiers and they were geolocalized close to Bakhmut. Bakhmut and there we have reports the Ukrainian side is claiming they destroyed a Russian troop concentration with 300 men killed and at least 50 being brought to hospitals. Usually, as you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not repeating those Ukrainian claims as I don't have any proof. In this context, it could be of some importance and it, it definitely, there, seem, there seems to be strong indications that something big actually happened because for once, in weeks, there was no report of Russian attacks on Bakhmut itself. So uh, the attacks continued and, and uh, the day after, they, they started again the day after. But in context with that supposed Ukrainian strike that killed 300 Russian soldiers, the attack stopped for one day. So there might be indication that there might actually be some truth to that. Whether it was obviously, whether it was 300 or less, or there is no proof, so we shouldn't take those numbers too much for granted but there seems to have been an attack and i found this here not in direct connection but it could obviously be that those interviews might have shown some information that led to the attack but that's more speculation from my side other than that we have attacks more or less along the whole front line this time i haven't heard of spirne again but bakhmutske solidar down ivangrad optune down to the line of avdivka the furthest and they're, they are going more or less along that line. But this time it's a little different than usual because we actually have a fair amount of successful, of cl su claimed successes by the Russian side. Pavlivka supposedly is, uh, conquered to half of it. Marinka, they have supposedly advanced. They supposedly have entered Pervomaiske, even though it's important that Pervomaiske is more or less stretching along that road, so they might have already been inside of it, depending on where the border of the town is actually is. Because here are still towns, uh, houses down to here, and they have been here for a while. But they also claim they have conquered Vodiane and they've uh, breached the defenses of Optini, even though there is some claim by other Russian military bloggers that the Russians haven't even crossed that river yet. If they have actually succeeded in Vodiane and in Optune, and there is at least image proof of them being close to Vodiane, uh, if they've actually succeeded here, then they'll obviously try to continue north to th and threaten Avdivka with encirclement. We see some geographic features here, and according to what we know from that front line, there are fallback lines, so we should not expect a vast breakthrough by the Russians, but we can expect that if the Russians actually succeed in advancing further north, that the time for the Ukrainians in Avdivka is coming to an end. The Ukrainians will have no further choice but to withdraw fairly soon if the advances are continuing, unless they want to get encircled here. Um, that was it from this side. So we have some advances, but no big ones, and most of them are unproven. So it might just be Russian propaganda, especially in regard to what I said in the last situation report, that the uh, that Prigozhin and Wagner are claiming advances that in some case at least don't seem to be full reality to make themselves appear better. On the southern front, we have the usual artillery, missile, cruise missile, air attack, etc. Uh, Shahid S-300 being used, Uragan Smerch, uh, shot, shot along, shooting along the whole front line, but no big changes on the ground. Uh, we have, though, claims by the Russians that the Ukrainians again tried to cross the reservoir and were defeated. Uh, this time they said the, with artillery fire they forced them back. Uh, some Russian military bloggers talk about high losses on the Ukrainian side, but I, there is no image proof to confirm that. In Kherson, we have the usual Ukrainian attacks, logistics, lines of communication, command centers, troop concentrations, ferries, pontoon bridges, barge bridges, etc. along the whole front line, ammunition storages, etc. All of this is, 
is the same as it's happening for months but we have more information about the rest the russian occupation authority is now saying they are going to defend kherson and the fortifications are continuing um, this is important in this regard as there were some speculations of the of the russians withdrawing and at least they are claiming now that they are going to defend it we have reports about um, strong fortification works being set up in uh, Hor no Baivka here, which would either indicate that they intend to shorten the front line or that they prepare for a Ukrainian breakthrough. Shortening the front line probably doesn't make too much sense because they would allow themselves to be pushed against the river here. But those are the reports. And we have also the Ukrainian uh, resistance center claiming that civilians are being forced to join in in the fortification work. Russia, the Ukrainian side is now saying Russians are withdrawing artillery over the bridge. There's some speculation that it might be redeployed somewhere else, but I actually think it's a smart move. It's if it's done in the proper context. You have to see that Uragan and Smerch have a range of 35 to 120 kilometers, depending on the missiles. Uragan usually is using 35 kilometer range missiles, but often longer ones as well. And one load for one launcher so one salvo takes a whole reload trucks cargo so every time uh Uragan or a smirch on this side is firing they need one additional truck to be ferried over the river so if you move the artillery systems to the other side and just leave them more or less along this line then they can fully be employed still along the front line you see it's barely under 35 kilometers but it is and Smerch can even keep shelling Mykolaiv and further back while their supply doesn't have to cross the river anymore. So this, in case this is what is happening, and that's my speculation looking at the situation here, it's actually a fairly smart move because it brings several advantages. Less supply has to be brought over the river because the, the artillery is no longer there. Secondly, the artillery can likely shoot far more often because the supply should, situation should be massively improved on this side of the river than on the other side. Thirdly, it can mostly still act along the front line here. Even in these areas, it might still fire at most of these areas. And in case of a Ukrainian breakthrough, in case of a collapse on the front line, those units don't have to be withdrawn. They don't have to destroy their equipment, etc. So in overall, moving them along on the other side of the river might shorten, might limit their tactical use, their abilities of what they can actually shell. But it might be justified according to the supply situation as the, the amount of, of um, fire missions they can do now should be higher than before, which might make up for the lack of range, for the loss of range that is, is occurring with this. So it might be an absolute smart move of this and i hope the hammering in the background isn't too annoying the sound filter should take out most of it but unfortunately i have workers here so um this is this might actually be the case in this case but that's my interpretation and my speculation reading the news in this way the ukrainian southern command is saying the deportations are continuing the russians are um, moving people from kherson but also from berislav and novo Kachovka here they are removing them and the Ukrainian general staff is saying that Russian soldiers are switching to civilian clothing and are occupying their houses. Now, here is the point where I have to emphasize again that the Ukrainian side, Ukrainian government sites obviously are active war participants and thus have a vested interest in doing propaganda in doing uh, shaping of the, the informational battlefield in this regard. So we shouldn't take them for granted. We shouldn't take the Russians for granted, of course, either. But in this regard, we should should be somewhat careful to this regard and, and try to check as much as we can. Uh, why they would change into civilian closing, I can't really say fully. It would be a war crime if they simulate to be civilians. And it wouldn't be the, by far not the first war crime done by the Russians. But what the point is in civilian clothing could be discussed. Maybe they want to try to fight Ukrainian soldiers while they wear civilian clothing. So the Ukrainian soldiers st um, start firing at their own civilians as in fear of partisans or something like this maybe it's so in case the ukrainians are shelling those towns as they identify them as troop concentrations the russians can present killed civilians whatever the reason for it is um i can't really say and we have this information from the ukrainian general staff which might be wrong in this regard which might tell the not tell the truth in this regard still 
Um, the reports are the Russians are now increasing the evacuation zone of by 15 kilometers along the river because they now claim the uh, Ukrainian side is planning a massive missile attack on the Novakarhovka dam to make it flood the area. So they want to evacuate the civilians here. Obviously, the Ukrainian side is calling this deportations. And um, while there might be some military use for the Ukrainian side in blowing up that dam right now. I've made a video about it. You'll find it on the channel. The, the likelihood of them actually being actually doing this in, in, in comparison to the, the downsides of destroying their own dam makes it highly unlikely. And we haven't even talked about the fact that I don't really see what weapon system they should use to destroy a massive dam because HIMARS is not the appropriate missile system to, tr to destroy a dam. Um, this is um, the information here. We also have news from the Ukrainian Southern Command that the Russians are turning off water, electricity and internet to force civilians to flee. Uh, they call, they have, as an example, they mentioned Novakarhovka, where they want to force, uh, wanted to force every Ukrainian civilian to leave it until today. They also uh, told the local shopkeepers, most, mostly of grocery stores, from what I understand, that uh, they are supposed to close from today on to evacuate the town. You heard in the past and past sitreps I've talked that the Novakarhovka is being prepared by the Russian side for um, house to house fighting, for urban fighting, which kind of makes sense in case the Ukrainians somehow manage to cross the dam in case of a breakthrough. We have um, now news from the Ukrainian side that a hundred, several hundred Rosgvardia Kadyrovci, so Chechens for Kadyrov, have um, uh, come to Kalanshak. What they are doing there, or, um, I can't really say, but there are still reinforcements coming here. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, GUR head, head of the GR, that's the military intelligence, Kirillo Bunanov is saying 40,000 Russian soldiers are in Kherson. But this is important. He's talking about Oblast Kherson. So it's including this side and the other side. And he mentioned that those are basically the best Russia has left. The best combat units, special forces, naval infantry that Russia has left is all in this side. And we have something that is not directly military, but directly connected to the resistance of the population. In the last Zitrep, I reported that the Russians are still trying to force the Ukrainians to use the ruble while they are still using the hryvnia, their own currency. And now they seem to have given up, the Russians. They now basically legalized the use of the hryvnia again, but it'll be exchanged by an unfavorable course uh, um, exchange rate with the ruble, which will probably tr um, be the, the attempt to force the Ukrainians to switch to ruble by economic pressure, not by political or military pressure like before. Whether that's going to work, we will have to see. But here, at least the resistance showed us in a significant way how big it still is, and it has actually achieved a small political goal. Um, we have reports about attacks along the northern line here. Uh, it continues. Uh, on one day, five attacks alone by the Russians were reported, but that was, wasn't all. So we have a couple of attacks more or less along that line here pushing th south, no territory gained by that. That seems to be probing attacks to find weak points. Uh, further west, we have indication that Ternovipodi might now be in Ukrainian hands again. But apart from that, not much movement along the front line. Before we switch to the mobilization and uh, the information about that we have, let's make a short summary. So a Ukrainian side still has the initiative in Kherson. Uh, they are probing the front line, trying to see where they can break through. The Russians are withdrawing some of their forces, probably to, to lessen the necessary supply throughput over the ferries on the river. Whether that's going to be successful, we'll have to see. But the Ukrainian side is claiming until the end of November. That was GUR head again, claiming that they will conquer the... Um, Kherson bridgehead, the Russian bridgehead, until the end of November. I have my doubts, though, but we will see. In the south, we have no significant territory changes in, in Saporizhia. Actually, I don't even have reports about ground attacks, even though we can at least expect some fighting, apart from the artillery duels. Here in the south, along more or less that line, a little bit north of Bakhmut, the usual attacks continue. The Russian side has the initiative. The supposed Ukrainian counterattack that the Russians warned us about for weeks, if not months by now, is nowhere to be seen. 
Uh, and according to the Russian side, they actually make small gains, and this time a couple of them, actually. Uh, we don't have full image proof. There might be some propaganda with it, but it seems to be uh, likely that at least they gain some ground there. Further north, um, when it comes from the border down to more or less Bilohorivka, the Ukrainian side has the initiative. While there are some Russian counterattacks, the Ukrainians are still advancing at a fairly slow pace. The amount of towns that are being liberated is clearly in the one digit per day. Sometimes we don't have a single report of a town being liberated in a day, but they are still advancing even though fairly slowly. So while the front is more or less static, or at least not moving too fast, we have a lot of information when it comes to the rear area, to the hinterland. Um, when it comes to the mobilization, we have an impressive example of the separation of powers in Russia. The Kremlin has now ordered the Russian judicial system to no longer give probation in case of sentences. Instead, there, sh there should be pointed the, the um, criminals that are being sentenced should be pointed towards the PMCs to basically nudge people to join PMCs instead of going uh, to prison. Um, if this is actually turning out, then we might even see additional um, fake trials, uh, made up charges to force people to either go to prison or go, go into the PMCs, which could obviously be used against opposition groups as well. Um, Lapin. Uh, Colonel General Lapine has been relieved of duty. It's not unclear if he has been relieved or is, if he stepped down. There were some rumors, some fake news spreading right afterwards that he supposedly was found dead in the Moskva River, but that has not been confirmed. That was fake news. Um, now there's fighting going on among the military bloggers, some of whom supported him, other of them opposed the, him and supported Prigushin and Kadyrov, which were who were both attacking him viciously in the past few weeks for his supposed incompetence. Um, what we can say is the fighting among the Russian military sphere about the incompetence and about the position of commanders is not helpful. Uh, having this discussion all the time, who, which commander is incompetent and should be fired, is not, making, is not letting the Russian military look in a good light. It's not making a good impression, so the morale should suffer from those from from them being uh, from these discussions as well it's definitely not helpful he's being replaced lapin is being repla replaced by lieutenant general andre mortvichev he is the commander of the eighth combined arms army of the southern military district i'm not completely sure if he retains command of that or not probably not but he is now he supposedly has replaced lapin now unfortunately i can't tell you whether he's suddenly a very competent man or something like this like most commanders he probably was in syria but i don't have any specific information about him as of yet uh, the russians are now trying to reduce religious tensions we've heard here in the situation reports a couple of times about deadly incidents of uh, recruits of mobilized men shooting others for religious um, for religious issues and the Russians are now trying to sell themselves as the defenders of Christian and Islamic values against the decadent and depravative, I think is the word, uh, West. And there's even a propaganda video popping up now with Islamic Russian soldiers. It's, it's, uh, the sound of it is, is Nashid. That's the Islamic singing that we know from Islamic State videos from Al-Nusra, etc., uh, where... It's now being done with Russian soldiers and at the same time it's saying that everything belongs to Allah and the Russian caliphate is rising. Okay, Rear Admiral Vladimir Simlyansky Tsim has said in a publication by the Russian military, military, Ministry of Defense that the conscripts that are being drafted today are not being used inside of Ukraine but the part that he didn't mention uh, that we obviously know is that Russia has annexed four Ukrainian provinces, five, I have to say, because Crimea was annexed in 2014. But they also annexed now recently Kherson, uh, Saporizhia, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. And according to Russian law and according to Russian understanding, this is not Ukraine. So if he says we are not going to use them in Ukraine, he basically legally only means we're not going to use them west and north of this line here. Um, but he... This part, this small part here is Mikulaev, and this is Kherson, uh, Kharkiv, but the rest of the Russian occupied territory is well within the five annexed provinces. So 
according to Russian law and according to Russian understanding and without contradicting Rear Admiral Vladimir Tsimlyansky, Russian conscripts could be used here and we can expect to see them come in this, uh, enter those units in a few weeks or maybe a few months, depending on the urgency of the situation. That Russia is not going to use 120,000 conscripts when they, in, in quotation marks, legally can, cannot be expected as Russia is aiming towards a long war and aiming towards defeating Ukraine. The Speaker of the Kremlin, Peskov, also said the um, partial mobilization legally is not over um, because it's not completely clear or formally is not over. It's not completely over because it's not completely clear whether Putin needs to issue another decree, um, but it's over. So they're not going to recruit. The interesting part here again is that gives, that means it's legally still in effect and that would give the Russian side the possibility to keep recruiting, um, to, to keep uh, calling up reserves as the Partial mobilization is still in effect. When we come to the political sphere, we hear one name we're going to keep hearing a lot in the future until he probably falls, might fall, until the point where he might fall out of a window, like a lot of others have done in the past few months, and that's Prigozhin. This time he has attacked the governor of St. Petersburg and told and said he is responsible for the creation of a criminal organization that is skimming government funds to enrich corrupt um, rep corrupt um, of workers for the government he asked the um, he, he, he said that's a fact and he asked the general prosecutor to start an investigation in this um, that he dares to attack the governor of St. Petersburg the most important the second most important city of Russia is saying a lot of where he sees his power to be now whether it, it is there or not we will probably see in the coming weeks but his popularity is massively on the rise because he's one of the most prominent figures in this war now and his troops are the only ones that are still advancing, at least according to him. Uh, now there has been local media asking him whether he plans to create a party or whether he wants to go into enter politics. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to go into politics. I'm just doing my duty for the government. Uh, whether it's going to stick with that is obviously a completely different question and we will see how the Kremlin will, will react if Prigozhin's star is, keep, is going to keep rising if his power is going to get bigger and bigger. Because now he also started, he announced the creation of a Wagner Center in St. Petersburg. That's a building that's supposed to house and employ uh, inventors, designers, IT specialists for um, to create prototypes and uh, startup uh, installations. Uh, they all should be in there to help and improve the defense capabilities of Russia. Um, he says he did not talk about this with the local government of St. Petersburg because uh, they are not representative enough to stop the work of Wagner. He basically uh, um, is disputing the claim to legitimacy for the local St. Petersburg government. You have to imagine what that actually means in the context. He said they can sue him. If they are unhappy with us now the interesting part here is too and this is really important in the context of this war and the power struggle because he is telling the legal st petersburg government to sue him for doing something illegal um while he is running a pmc a private uh, like a pmc company private military contractor company a mercenary company which is illegal under russian the russian constitution so he's doing something illegal while being head of an illegal institution and is, is saying legitimate governments don't, are, are illegal, don't have legitimacy and they should sue him. This shows how high he sees himself above the law and in the power structure by now. He also said, should that Wagner Center be successful, he's going to create other in different cities. So this will not be the last time we hear of Prigozhin. His star is on the rise until maybe he falls off. A, out of a window but we will have to see and we will follow him on this channel what is going on there when it comes to the support we have news from spain spain uh, said or or in context with spain i have to say i think it was the last sit trip or one of the last where i said spain is going to deliver hawk air defense systems to ukraine now hawk is i think from the late 50s so it's like probably a first generation air defense system missile system 
Uh, it can obviously be extensively modified and modernized, but it's a fairly old system. And U the US decommissioned the last systems in 2002. But according to the British Forces News, which from my understanding is a government um, military, like for the, for the Ministry of Defense of, of Great Britain, it's the news agency. And they said US still have a lot of them on storage and they still store 40,000 missiles. That's true, both the numbers and that the Ukraine, US will supply Ukraine with it. That would be more or less the perfect solution when it comes to cruise missiles, as cruise missiles and even the Shahid-136 don't have any defensive mechanisms like flares, like um, chaff or anything like this. They are just straight flying. And especially with the Shahid-136, they are fairly cheap. So using highly modern air defense system like Iris-T, like, uh, or even like S-300, anything like this that is aimed at shooting down high-value target planes, etc., is a complete waste of money and an absolute loss. But if you find 40,000 air defense missiles that are just lying around and nobody needs anymore, that's a whole different story. The range of the of the Hawk system is more or less 40 kilometers, so they can actually reach out to some degree. And while the guidance system might be obsolete and while the missiles might be fairly slow with only Mach 2.4 more or less, that's more than enough against cruise missiles. And that's more than enough against Shahid-136 if the targeting, etc. works. So that could actually be a massive improvement to the Ukrainian defense against uh, cruise missiles and uh, suicide drones. Italy, where there was some discussion whether it might side with Russia, according to the new right-wing government, has now promised a massive new delivery of weapons for Ukraine. Uh, Italy is going to deliver six Panzerbitze 2000. That's the German um, self-propelled howitzer that was talked about quite a lot in the past. They're going to deliver two M270 um, multiple launch rocket systems. They are they have double the double the capacity of a HIMARS. So that's more or less you want to put it in simple terms, that's more or less two high Mars glued together in one. It's on tracks and it's it's a better armored, etc., but it's more or less firing the same missiles, just twice as many. It can carry twice as many. They're also going to deliver up to 30 M109L Paladin. That's a locally uh, modernized version where they changed the barrel of the gun with a much longer one that is comparable to the Feldhaubitze 70, the FH-70 that Italy already donated to Ukraine that can fire modern 155 NATO ammunition, including base bleed. And I think they can even fire Excalibur, even though I'm not completely sure there. But that means the M109L has an extended range and with the appropriate ammunition, it's supposed to be able to reach out to 40 kilometers. So while the system might not have the most modern fire control system, its range at least is outranging the majority of the Russian artillery and Italy is going to deliver up to 30 of those. They're also going to add several dozen of the M113. Um, that's the old APC from the Vietnam era that is still in use all over the world and where Ukraine has already received dozens, if not hundreds of them in the past. Not the greatest tool, but still much better than an unarmored car in any uh, military operation. Uh, the, we now have the first news from uh, weapons being ap appearing in, in Finland. That's uh, weapons that were delivered for, to Ukraine inside of the war. They are, um, criminal networks are funneling them to organize crime in Finland. Uh, among that supposedly are motorcycle clubs. That's not much of a surprise. Um, when you deliver hundreds of thousands of weapons, when you have local points where volunteers can pick up their own assault rifle as it was done at the beginning of the war, when you have losses of people and nobody's going to keep book over where exactly every single rifle has been that some of them disappear, it's unfortunately just uh, shouldn't be any surprise to anyone and that Organized crime will bank on that and use that is is not much of a surprise. But this is now the first confirmed uh, appearance in Finland. In this case, the Finnish police has, has said. Um, we have interesting news now from Turkey. Uh, Baikar, which is the maker of the Bayraktar TB2, which is in usage of Ukraine, is not only working on the Akinci, which Ukraine doesn't have, but as far as I know, at least, is the only... Uh, UCAF, the only drone that is actually rated for air-to-air -air missions. So it's meant to shoot down planes and other drones. Uh, at least it's the only system of this kind already in use that I know of. 
And according to this new site, which should be Turkish, Bike, Bike Car is now working on modifying the TB2 to, so it, it, it too can fire air-to-air -air missiles, which then could, could be used to shoot down drones, for instance, the Shahid 136. This would obviously be a massive improvement as the Ukraine has a, should have a sizable amount of TB2s which can only be used very lim limited by now as Russia has now adjusted to the threat posed by them and has changed its air defense system and intensified it. So the Ukrainians themselves said they had trouble using them because they were threatened too much by Russian air defense system. Now, if you, if you give them air-to-air -air missiles and allow them to hunt down Shahid-136 drones, then you've given them a new purpose which you can use until you've weakened the Russian air defenses again. So it would obviously be a massive improvement that would help uh, Ukraine to defend its its civilian infrastructure against the cheap Ukrainian drones. Um, and another good news before we end with really bad ones are what happened in Pskov, which you can see here is close to Estonia. On a military airbase there, three combat helicopters of the Russians exploded, two Ka-52 and one um, MI-2828N, uh, they exploded for what reason, whether that was sabotage, whether it was somebody smoking, is obviously unknown or is unknown as of now, at least as far as I know, but three heli combat helicopters at once that will no longer be able to be used against uh, Ukraine. And before we end, we have one bad news, and that is that the rumors are intensifying. I first heard about them like two weeks ago, or maybe three or four weeks ago, or a few weeks ago at least, that Russia is buying ballistic missiles from Iran, and that seemed, it's now intensifying, so it seems more and more likely. There are, there are talks about the systems having a range of 300 to 700 kilometers, and Ukraine has the problem that most of its air defense, or almost all of its air defense is, systems, is meant against planes, not against ballistic missiles coming down so uh, 700 kilometers would obviously be a massive range if we were to expect them to be used from here we could probably almost reach no they could actually reach almost uh, Lviv from from Kherson oblast on the other side of the river so most of Ukraine would be in range of them if they use them from Belarus which seems likely um, then all of Ukraine could be bombarded with this uh, which would obviously be a serious problem for the Ukrainians as they'd have no means of defending against this. And Iran's missile arsenal is quite extensive, though there should be a fair number of those that are that can be made available for the Russians. So let me think in the comments what you think. Is this going to change anything along the whole front line? Is this going to change? Is this going to be a game changer in the war? If Russia is starting to get ballistic missiles, that's going to be an interesting discussion, and I'm really interested in what you think about this. And we'll end this uh, the sitrep with this uh, message. And I want to thank uh, thank those of you who supported the channel very much. This channel wouldn't be possible without the without the support of viewers like you. So thank you very much for to everyone who is already supporting. And if you also want to support the channel, you can do so by the means stated in the description. Thank you very much. And you can also support the channel with non-financial means, obviously hitting the like button. Commenting is good for the algorithm. If you haven't subscribed yet, I want to invite you to subscribe and don't forget the bell icon so you don't miss future videos in case the algorithm tries to hide them from you. And if you want to help the channel grow, please recommend this channel to friends and acquaintances. That's it from me for now. Thank you for watching and I'll be back.